Uh, <coughs> good morning. Good morning. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> how many remembered Valentine's Day and how many how many received flowers or gave flowers and uh, it's all been very quiet here, very quiet. Well, we've got some visitors. Could we have our visitors announced? Nick, you've got a visitor? Uh, Richard O'Shea. Richard? Also knows, grew up with Cole Styles. So a bit of a connection with both. Oh, well, we won't, we won't hold that against him. <laughs> we won't hold that against him. Richard, welcome. Thank you very much. Andy, you've got a visitor? Yes, I have. A gentleman sitting next to me here, Phil Carter, who's an old Paradian and uh, looking forward to being part of this club. Great. All right. <laughs> Welcome. Um, uh, our learned vice president, unfortunately, has been pressed into magisterial duties at Morwell which is something which will keep him fairly occupied, I would suspect. So he is, a, uh, he is an apology today. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it um, because he's dispensing justice at Maul. Uh, so I might, we won't call the roll, but I'll just take any, any apologies uh, that, we, that want to record. Gary? Yeah, I've got Rob Adams yep. and also Brian McMahon. Okay, thank you. Detlef Hingst. Thanks, Kev. And um, David Taylor. David Taylor. John Horsfall and Ron Speechley. John Horsfall and Ron. Thanks, David. You may say a word about them later in your report. Okay. Um, do we have any birthdays? No birthdays. February's a quiet month for birthdays. Um, <laughs> just, uh, just a couple of, a couple of little, a couple of little snippets from uh, from the parish of Dibley. Um, Miss Charlene Mason sang, "I will not pass this way again," giving obvious pleasure to the congregation. <laughs> Please place your donation in the envelope along with the deceased person you want remembered. <laughs> Potluck supper, Sunday at five. Prayer and medication to follow. <laughs> and this is a good one. The eighth graders will be presenting Shakespeare's Hamlet in the church basement. Friday at 7 p.m. The congregation is invited to attend this tragedy. <laughs> and I've got, a, I've, I've got a couple of doctors ones here. I've, 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 I can't resist. I can't resist for our medical colleagues. The doctor gave a man six months to live. The man couldn't pay his bill. So the doctor gave him another six months. <laughs> the doctor called Mrs. Cohen saying, Mrs. Cohen, your check came back. Mrs. Cohen answered, so did my arthritis. <laughs> <laughs> Patient, I have ringing in my ears. Doctor, well, don't answer it. <laughs> All right. Now, we have an important, important uh, function to perform, and uh, Joe Hansberg is joining us as a member. Uh, he's been to a couple of meetings, and I'd ask Colin Stiles uh, if he'd just briefly introduce Joe, and then we'll formally in induct Joe as a member of this club. Col. Greetings, all, and particularly Joe. Um, Joe is down there. Stand up, Joe. Let's have a look at you. That's what Joe looks like. There you go. Yeah. Joe introduced himself uh, with an inquiry into the Crobus, and with the normal secretarial non efficiency, I responded after about two weeks. But what a great joy to have a conversation with him. 
He's born in Zimbabwe. He's a proper doctor. Well, my brother said, you're not a bloody doctor. But Joe is a proper doctor, a PhD in things to do with botany, and he's done extensive research via CSR and other activities into trees and how they work. So you better tell us a bit about the greenhouse disasters or whatever we've been confronted with. Joe's travelled widely, and uh, we're very pleased to have you, Joe. Thanks, Cole. Thank you very much. Joe, if you'd like to uh, to come forward, and I'll uh, I'll formally induct you into our uh, into our club. Um, uh, now that you have been introdu introduced, it is my pleasure to formally welcome you and to admit you to the fellowship of the Privacy Club of Heidelberg. As from now, you have full rights of membership of our club. <coughs> Probus is constituted as a low-key organisation and we would prefer to keep it that way. The club's basic purpose is to provide a pleasant and interesting meeting place where acquaintance can be broadened and good fellowship can be enjoyed by compatible people. We want membership to continue to be attractive to people like yourself and we're very pleased that you've decided to join us. The club asks very little of its members. There are no strict rules in respect of attendance, but only by attending regularly can you enjoy the friendship and the fellowship which are now available to you through the club. In turn, it is only by your regular attendance that you can give us the pleasure of knowing you better and enjoying your company. Occasionally, you may be asked to carry out some tasks to assist in the running of the club, and we hope, if and when that occurs, that you will respond willingly. And now, in commending Probus and its principles to you, I offer on behalf of all members the right hand of Probus Fellowship. May I ask all members present to show the warmth of our welcome to our new member, Joe. <laughs> Joe, would you like to say a few words? Well, thank you, David. Well, the reason I have joined here is looking for fellowship and companionship. We've been down in Melbourne for a couple of years, having come down from New South Wales, and I wasn't making any contacts much, so someone recommended Probus to me, this one, and um, it certainly seems to have been an excellent recommendation. I'm delighted to be here, and I look forward to getting to know you all a great deal better. Um, Sometime along, David says he will get me up here and I'll bore you a bit with history or whatever. But meanwhile, it's great to be here and thank you very much. I've just got to pick up my notes. If I can. Yep. Uh, Thanks, Bruce. Okay. Um, Colin, anything you'd like to report as secretary? Um, I've been in a general meeting and um, those um, who might wish to become members of the committee and other sorts of things, but those forms to fill out the book club. Today we're having an exchange on the book club. Yeah, they're the main thing. Thanks, yeah. Thanks for mentioning the, the AGM, uh, which will be the 14th of March. Um, a notice of relating to the meeting was in the, in the newsletter, uh, as well as a nomination form for anyone interested in a position. And uh, the report of the committee, the minutes of the last AGM, and the financial statement and the agenda for the AGM will be attached to Bruce's newsletter at the end of the month. So please read them and uh, we can then take them as read at the meeting rather than having to read them out then. But uh, 
they'll be with the with the newsletter, and uh, March will be a big meeting because we'll have our normal meeting and our uh, our AGM. Um, uh, our esteemed treasurer of Bert, I think, uh, anything to report on the Cash current... Cash balance is $1,196.34 in petty cash. And the statement will be, as you said, in the uh, newsletter. Thanks, Bert, and thanks very much for your uh, efforts as treasurer over the year. We really... It's been a great, great burden, I might say. <laughs> <laughs> all the money. We, 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 we hope it hasn't been too much for you, but, uh, <laughs> but, but you've done a terrific job. David Line, our armourer, I think, has got a few things to report. David? I have. Do you want to come up here? or? No, I'll stand. Okay. Okay. Everyone can hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'll speak up. Um, I spoke to Beryl Abad over the weekend. Uh, Rodney's still in the nursing home, and... Uh, He's had a lot of back pain and recently had some specialist pain relief, <coughs> which has made him much brighter, so that's good. I also talked to John Horsfall, who has undergone uh, spinal surgery and is now in rehab at uh, Epworth in Brunswick and uh, having a little bit of difficulty in mobilising, but, but getting there. Um, I also talked to Ron Speechley, who's been in hospital and subsequently rehab, uh, and <coughs> now back at the, uh, the Regis Nursing Home in Brighton. Thanks for listening. Well done. Okay. Um, can I just uh, again um, record our appreciation for uh, David's work as Armina uh, in keeping in touch with our our colleagues and. Uh, uh, keeping us informed on on how everyone's going, it's a it's a very a very important role in the club, David, and we and we really appreciate your efforts. My pleasure. Um, now, the man who goes everywhere, Mr. Excursion. <laughs> yeah, I got on. Yep. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. How's everyone today? Can you all hear me? Okay. No worry. That's good. Good to see you all here today. We've got quite a, gr a group. I hope everyone's got their name on the list of us staying for lunch. If not, um, let me know and I'll duck down and put your name on so that the chef can have your lunch for you at half past 12, okay? Um, January, Tuesday the 17th was the President's Barbecue. The ones who went, I think they all enjoyed themselves. We had 35 turn up, which was fantastic. Absolutely good. Thanks very much for everyone for attending. Wednesday the 22nd of February is the combined Probus Club's trip to Geelong, visiting the mill markets with lunch at Van Loom's Nursery. The cost is $50 per person for the bus, paying all else on the day yourselves, okay? The pickup is Hardyman Street in Bandura Park on Plenty Road at 9 a.m. sharp, the bus leaves. The money for the outing must be paid today for booking of the bus, okay? If there's anyone else that's still interested in going, they can put their name on the list and pay me today. You can go, there are still seats available. Um, we need to build up the our representation from our club. It's declining a little bit. The other clubs have got quite, the other two clubs have got quite a few people going, but we've only got about seven, I think. We'd like to get a few more going if we possibly can. So if you can, please put your name on the list and I will take the money from you. Wednesday the 22nd of March is the Combined Clubs Barbecue held at Springthorpe Retirement Village, 8 Pottage Circuit McLeod at 12pm. The cost is $15. It's a must to be paid today or will not be catered for. And we need more to come along to that one as well. We're not being represented very much with the other clubs, which is a bit of a shame because we're the oldest club in the district and I think it's time that we all got together and joined in with these things if you possibly can. Um, you'll need to bring your knife, fork, plate, glass and a little light refreshment on the today. Everything else will else will be provided. I have put in the newsletter for you and on April we have a list on the table over there for a bus trip to the Yarra Valley, wi Yarra Valley wineries to see how many would join us. The bus is a 20-seat bus, 
uh, for the first in best dressed. Okay, to seat for a seat. Um, there will be more information later on. So if anyone's interested, please put your name on the list and say, look, I think I could go to that. Um, I haven't got any prices at the moment. I'm still working on it and where we're going and so forth. But that's no date. It's in April. It will be, it'll be our, outing, our outing day in April, OK? Um, and April the 29th to the 6th of May is the eight-day trip to Sydney and the Blue Mountains. Those going, the final payment is due on the 17th of the 3rd. Uh, May, Tuesday the 9th is the 40th anniversary of lunch for our, our club. Held at St George's Church, 46 Warn Warncliffe Road, East Ivanhoe. We're nearly there with price and times. There is a list on the table to start putting your names and numbers on. Please do so, so it gives us an idea for catering. We've got nearly everything booked, the tall's booked, the caterer's booked, um, we've got other things on the go, Graham's got other things on the go as well, the two of us have been working together and we've just about got it there, so you'll have the information probably by the end of the month. Um, July the 31st to August the 9th is a 10 day trip to Cooper Pedy in the Red Centre. The info has been given out for those wanting to go, if interested call Group Link Direct and they will do the booking for you. Another little thing too, I've put in the newsletter and also I'll read it out today, a reminder if coming to the next month's meeting and staying for lunch, please put your name on the list. If you have put your name on the list and can't come, please ring me and cancel. We have to help the RSL as much as we can. They are only got a short lot of staff here, so please do that for me. Okay, I'll leave you with this. It's called the taxi driver. A taxi passenger tapped the driver on the shoulder and asked him a question. The driver screamed, lost control of the car, nearly hit a bus, went up on the footpath and stopped inches before hitting a shop window. For a second everything went quiet in the taxi when the driver said, Look mate, don't ever do that again, you scared the daylights out of me. The passenger apologised and said, I didn't realise that a little tap would scare you so much. The driver replied, sorry. It's not only your fault, today is my first day as a cab driver. I've been driving a funeral van for the past 25 years. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. <laughs> Thanks very much. Now, don't forget to put your names down, OK? Bye for now. Graham. Oh, yeah, Graham, yes. yeah. Yes. Just a uh, plug for the Heidelberg oh, Coal yeah, Society. Yeah. Their next concert will be on Sunday the 1st of April at 2.30. And the venue is the Catholic Church of the Sacred Heart, 116 Cotton Road, Q, which I understand is the corner of Glen Ferry Road and, um, and Cotton Road. Cotton Road. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. This, the, uh, Music uh, is a heraldic handle and magnificent Mozart, which means it's classical music, I guess. Um, <laughs> the tickets are now on sale through Ticket Tech. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, Graham. Yep, I think that's, uh, that church will be good because it's pretty big, so uh, I'll be able to uh, fit plenty of uh, plenty in. But uh, speaking from from our experience. Um, will be there because the, uh, the group is outstanding. Um, just to, uh, just to again record our thanks to, to Gary and his team for the President's Barbecue because it was a great event and uh, having the availability of Springthorpe Community Centre was terrific. Uh, meant that we didn't run the risk of, uh, of uh, melting in the hot weather. So Gary, again, many thanks to Thank you, you and your team for uh, <coughs> making that such an enjoyable occasion. All right. Well, now we're going to we're going to move to <coughs> members' corner, and um, Bruce is going to take us through an interesting story about a mini that. Uh, was 
an important part of his life for some time and uh, he had a recent uh, encounter with the Mini. So, Bruce, uh, it's, it's over to you, my friend, from here. Okay, can we just have a, a moment or two while I get organised? Yep, yep. Um, to give you a chance. Electronically. Yes. So, uh, one or two minutes uh, yep. mini break. Yep. Just while you organise. Well, we'll have a mini break while Bruce gets, gets his uh, presentation organised. Yeah, have you got your name on the list? Do you know? Okay. I haven't got the list here. It's downstairs. They're organising lunches, you see. That's a big thing. No, no, no. I'll, I'll fix that up, okay? Yep, it's under the hood. I don't think so. It's under the hood. I don't know what. I don't know what. Yeah. It's under the hood. It's under the hood. I'll need you to prop up the projector. I'll need the... Uh, okay, I'll pass it on. <laughs> I think that I think it's out the back. I think it is too. They'll just make it easier. If you want to turn off the lights, it's there. Okay, that's where you turn off the lights. Well, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to stand and be at the lectern because I have to drive the computer from where it is and therefore I'm going to have to sit at the computer. So I apologise for that in advance. Also, there's some audio in the presentation which might not come out terribly well, but if I sit at the computer, I might be able to pick up some of that audio via this. So hopefully that will work. I also hope to record the presentation because we're recording the whole meeting and those of you who would like to watch it again, which of course is all of you, isn't it? Uh, you'll be able to do that via our website. So without further delay, let's get underway. I'll try and not make it too long, but this could go on for hours and hours and hours. But it's not going to. 10 or 15 minutes, hopefully, tops. So it's entitled, Can or Could a Little Car, meaning the pointed to car, usurp the Indian Pacific? 
And of course, the next question is, what do you mean by that? I hear you ask. You must all be asking that question. So let me, first of all, set the scene. <clears throat> this is not meant to be a travelogue presentation. It's meant to be about a trip that myself and my partner did on the Indian Pacific, first Perth to Sydney, and tacked on at the end of the trip in Sydney was a visit to a previously owned car. I'll briefly give in this presentation some background to the car, some background to the trip on the Indian Pacific, and that's the travel log bit to some degree, some experiences uh, from the Indian Pacific, and I'm sure some of you will have done the Indian Pacific yourselves, some experiences from visiting the car, my old Mini, and then pose the question, could one of these actually usurp the other? Interesting question. I'll, te I'll attempt to answer that question. That's the purpose of this presentation. Could one of those usurp the other? So first of all, just a little bit about the car, the Mini, and that's it back at my family home around 1970. Nothing special, you might think, but we will see. In 1968, I was 20, 20 years old. And you'll know that because you've read my bio in the uh, newsletter a few issues back. I was working at the TNG, having failed first year university and got kicked out at that stage. I also had, at that time, a 1963 Mini, a Mini Cooper, but it was second rate. I wanted the latest a Cooper S. My mother helped me buy a brand new one because I didn't have the money, but she helped me get one from then Peter Manton Motors, and anyone who knows motorsport will know the name Peter Manton. In 1980, or thereabouts, and I can't remember the exact date, I sold it, rightly or wrongly, I sold it. About 2015, I was contacted by Sydney retired architect Graham Smith and he said, are you the original owner of this car? And I said, yes, I am, because he was now the owner. And since that time, I have had many emails, photos, conversations and what have you between Graham and I. And Graham said, well, of course, you must come and have a look at this car next time you're in Sydney. Nice invitation. So how does the Indian Pacific fit into this? Well, in 2018, I was 70, and Jan and I went on the Garn from Darwin to Adelaide to celebrate uh, my 70th birthday. That was fabulous. The Garn was really good. So we decided, let's do something similar for your 70th birthday. So we booked the Garn, uh, booked the Indian Pacific rather, for Jan's 70th birthday, which was to be in July 2020 at that time. In 2022, we finally did the Indian Pacific due to delays, due to that thing called COVID. And there we were on the Indian Pacific in the middle of Australia at a place called Cook, as many of us will know. <laughs> We also arranged that when we got to Sydney, at the end of that trip, we would take up Graham on his standing invitation to visit the Mini. So the two would come together, the Indy Pacific and the visit to the Mini. So off we went to Perth and the trip and the visit to the Mini started. So we decided we weren't just going to go to Perth, we were going to go in style. So off we went to Perth in style on a very good as has always been my experience with Qantas. You hear a lot about Qantas in the media, not my experience. Every time I've been with Qantas, which is quite a lot, it's been very good, and that trip was no ex exception. We got to Perth, so we had a look around Perth, of course, and had many great coffees. As you may know, I'm a coffee fiend, so we had plenty of good coffees and visited Fremantle, which was deserted. 
uh, which was uh, interesting, but we had a look around in Fremantle and had some more coffee in Fremantle as well. While in Perth, we did the usual touristy things, went to Rottnest Island, and Rottnest Island also has quokkas, as you may know. And some of you may not know what a quokka does. This is what a quokka does. <laughs> Come on, quokka. <laughs> and there should be audio with that, but the audio is not coming through, unfortunately. <clears throat> but that's what a quokka does. So if you haven't seen a quokka before, you'll need to go to Rockness Island to see it. Rats. We also took a side trip, three days side trip to Margaret River while in Perth, and that was um, really great as well. Went and visited a coffee roastery, we went and visited some amazing caves, and we also visited the uh, tour leader's uh, residence where he raised horses and did various things, and that was quite, uh, quite great, as, quite good as well. So Margaret River, yep, very good. Very impressed with Margaret River. <coughs> then, of course, back to Perth and onto the train. So before we left Perth, we were given more coffee and uh, a welcoming sort of departure uh, in the dining car of the Indian Pacific before we sort of left. So there we were. Uh, in the Indian Pacific dining car, ready to leave Perth. And before, uh, before we left Perth, you know, and just summarising the whole trip, the accommodation on the train was very good and the meals and everything were very good. A quick look at the accommodation on the train. This is our uh, apartment uh, on the train during day mode. And that's what it looked like in uh, night mode. Very, very comfortable, as you can sort of tell from that. And we had our own uh, shower, our own wash basin and so on. And the dining car looked like that, very nice. And we also had uh, moving onboard entertainment which came through from time to time. And that guy was particularly good as well, actually. He was quite good. The dining car meals were very good and the crew requested that we wear our robes that they supplied not quite sure why they did, but they said, could you wear your robes to breakfast tomorrow morning? So everyone was asked to wear their robes to breakfast, and we did. So everyone turned up in their robes for that particular <coughs> breakfast, which looked look quite good, but... Yeah. <coughs> Let's get the thing to advance. And the train crew were particularly good as well. Uh, they like to get involved, so um, they did. Ah, that one didn't work. Just go back because that's worth. No, it's not going to. I'm not going to behave today. But oh, there we go. Again, the the sound is not there, but. The, the, the staff actually wanted to perform for us. This was sort of after dinner and some of the, some of the passengers had returned to their accommodation but these, these girls just wanted to dance. And there was music, they played music and they, unfortunately the music is not coming through but they actually wanted to dance for us, so they did. And so they danced in the car. As you can see, and they were enjoying themselves and that was, uh, that was quite something. And the, the music was, uh, I want to dance with somebody, and that was what the music was that they were dancing to. That was, that was quite something. Anyway, just summarising the trip, the, the route, of course, for the Indian Pacific was Perth through the desert to Adelaide, then from Adelaide back through Broken Hill. So we were supposed to go through Broken Hill, the Blue Mountains uh, to Sydney. But that was changed due to track washouts and we actually went through uh, Victoria and we missed out on Broken Hill, we missed out on the Blue Mountains, but because we went through Victoria, which is quite unusual for the Indian Pacific, 
we went through Stall, which was a childhood family holiday town for me. So that was uh, a bonus to actually go through Stall. And it was 7 o'clock at night, we were in the dining car having dinner and we roared through Stall. And that was quite emotional for me to go through uh, Stall in the Indian Pacific, quite something. And then the train was terminated at Goulburn and we were coached from there to Sydney. So that was an unusual rerouting of the train. When we got to Sydney, we were met uh, and taken in a limousine, which was part of the Platinum Class deal from Sydney up to where we were staying to meet Graham. And he was up in uh, the Northern Beaches at a place called Bayview. So we were taken on that route from Sydney up to Graham's house. And that was the house that met us because I hadn't been here. Jan hadn't been there, we didn't know what to expect, and that's where we were taken to that amazing house, which was designed and built by Graham himself, being a, an architect. It had won the House of the Year Award in 2018 in the three to four million dollar category, and it has reputedly the best view over Pitwater Harbour that it's possible to get. So what is that view? That's the view you see from that balcony. It is just stunning as you can imagine. And the rest of the house, just a couple of pictures, I, I can't do justice to it, oh, obviously, it is, it is just stunning. The house is just stunning. And Graham's got his own workshop um, in the house. He just didn't want to go outside, so that his workshop is just amazing within the house. But we weren't there to see the house. Oh, that's the award that the house won. We weren't there, we were there to see the Mini. Where is it? And he took us to show it. Oh, there it is. Wow, there's my old Mini. It looks better than when I owned it. And he had plans for showing it off to me. He wanted to do two primary things. He wanted to take me for a run in it, and he also wanted to interview me about it and saying, well, what's it like seeing your old car again? So, he intended to take me for a run from this beautiful area in which he lived up to a place called West Head. And I'd never seen any of this part of New South Wales before, and perhaps some of us haven't either. So what, what he did was to take us on a run, which he does regularly with his car club mates, um, which, we, which he calls a mini run, up to West Head. And it, I've got a, a brief um, extract of that run, and it shows how he stores the mini currently, it shows the beautiful views from his home and it shows what it looks like. So Graham and I did that run in the Mini and Jan and his wife Tricia followed us in Tricia's car. And this is just a, a minute or so extract of that which I hope will play. The others didn't play and I don't know why that's not behaving correctly. It's not, looks as though that's not going no, it's playing. But the sound, the sound, there's really no sound, but it's just a minute or so of the beautiful area that he lives in and how he actually stores the car. So that's, that's what he sees from his house, basically. That is just stunning. The catchphrase, how the other half lives. And this is his garage. That's his work car. So he says, you know, I'm not, not going to use that. I'm going to use the Mini. And this is how he... <laughs> this is how he stores it. This is where it's garaged. And he, he got that specially built to, to store it. And David has subsequently told me that he tried to do that for his MGs but wasn't able to because the garage wasn't big enough. That's right. So this is, this is my old car. So that's, that's us going off it and, um, And that's me sitting on the left and Graham sit, drive, driving the car. Hey, Graham offered me a drive of it. Uh, I really wasn't going. I couldn't risk damaging it. And this is West Head where we drove to. And if I lived in an area like that, I would own a car like that. Driving it is just stunning in that sort of area. 
So that's what we did. He was also keen to interview me about the car, ask me some questions about it. And that's an, I can't show you the, the um, whole thing, of course, but if you're interested, um, there is a link which you can get from looking at this transcript of the presentation, and it's on YouTube. You can actually see me being interviewed by Graham. And he asked me questions like, what's it like to see it, you know, after all this time, blah, 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 blah. Um, and these are a couple of pictures taken from that um, transcript. But he doesn't want the Mini to be lonely, so he went and bought a Mustang. <laughs> literally, literally. So two reasons. One was that the Mini is a bit small for his wife, Tricia, who's got a few physical problems with her back. <clears throat> When they go for long trips, the Mini is a bit small, obviously. So he said, OK, I'll buy this. So he bought the Mustang, and that has got everything known to automotive science on it. And boy, can that thing go. He took me for running that, and that's, that's scary. Personally, I have no interest in that thing. <laughs> but to get back in the Mini was just incredible. You know, the Mini just took me back to my, my youth and amazing. Anyway, summary and conclusions of all, from all this was visiting Perth, Perth and Fremantle, very impressive. I haven't been there for many years. Fabulous, clean, lovely city. Margaret River, lovely. Rottnest Island, very good. Jan absolutely loved Rottnest Island. I thought it was very nice, but she, she was over the moon about Rottnest. And it was her birthday after all. Indian Pacific, very good, you know, accommodation, food and so on. And I'm a bit of a train buff, a bit like John Don Metcalf. The change in schedule, however, I found a little disappointing, even though we did go through a stall. Overall, perhaps not quite as good as the gun. And train chatter amongst fellow passengers was that um, the gun is the best, uh, Indian Pacific second, and anyone that's been on the Great Southern third that was how they seemed to see the three of them. The Mini revisited hosts in the locale that we went to to see it. Absolutely stunning. Now, I'd never been, as I said, to that area before. Absolutely stunning. So we were blown away by the accommodation that we were provided in the hospitality. And the Mini itself, amazing to see it again after all these years, 50 something years, and to see it in condition as good as, if not better than when I had it. Incredible to ride in it again. I mean, they're amazing little cars, absolutely amazing. And it was privileged to take part in the YouTube video that Graham produced, which is about 10 or 15 minutes. It's quite amazing. You should have a look at it if you've got any interest in that sort of thing. So, to recall that we were trying to compare whether one could usurp the other. Did it? In my view, at the time, absolutely. We came home thinking, how could you know that trip be usurped by the visit to Sydney? But it was at the time. But as we sort of thought about it, on reflection, both were great and memorable, but like an ice cream, it can start to leak. And you think, hang on, this is a messy damn thing. You know, maybe the ice cream isn't as good as we first thought. But, you know, but, but. So, overall, for me, personally, perhaps not... Yeah. Well, Jan agrees with me, actually. The Mini Revisit will remain, personally, especially memorable. Because, because of what it, what it meant to me in my youth, and to see it again, and to see it in such a fantastic place. So... It really is still winning trophies in the car world. And so to see it again in that environment, and it's now parked in Graham's personal car park for visitors, that's what it looks like. So, yes, I think it did usurp the trip in some ways, even though the trip on the Indian Pacific and all that went with it was pretty good. Um, it, yeah, this, this little car and its revisiting was, was pretty special. Okay, so uh, thank you. Well, that's good. How many K's on the clock? 
Um, I think it's up to about 60, some, 60 something thousand miles, which is not bad when you think about it. 1968. Gen, genuine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, we're, we're, we've got our guest speaker here, so we'll move on. Grab some lights and a microphone. Thanks, mate. Put some lights on the lights. Yep. <laughs> Eric. 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 David Jones. Good. Sorry, John. Uh, got <laughs> going to do a presentation <coughs> for us. Um, uh, our Vice President, uh, John Doherty, uh, very kindly arranged for him to be here. Uh, and as I mentioned, John got called away to go to Moore. But um, Eric's going to talk to us about the subject which we've all no doubt been interested in, 
namely the Titanic uh, and its, uh, and its uh, fateful voyage. So uh, he's, he's going to do it from the rostrum and um, we thank him for being here and uh, I'll hand over to Eric. Thank you. You told everybody it was a fateful voyage. He spoilt the uh, presentation now. <laughs> but I suppose you all know the um, ending. Now, just uh, before, is anybody in the room Irish, by the way? Yes, we lost all. Oh, we've got a few. Well, my father used to say there's only two types of people in this world, Irish and people who think they're Irish. <laughs> now, we are going to talk about Titanic, and it's, uh, the story is in fact in two parts. One is why and how she was constructed, and the second part, of course, is her um, maiden voyage. Um, now, the talk on Titanic, it, it's a tragedy, and there is no jokes, unfortunately, and I like to tell you jokes, but it's all about uh, loss of life and human tragedy. But I do allow one joke, and it's about the tipsy first-class passenger in the saloon bar, the time of the collision with his whiskey on ice and saying to the bartender, I asked for ice, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> now, at the turn of the uh, 20th century, the time Titanic was uh, created, uh, Britain controlled a quarter of mankind and she did so by her powerful merchant navy and of course supported by the Royal Navy. Britain of course imported about 70% of its um, raw materials in order to survive and it did so of course with outposts in uh, Hong Kong, Gibraltar, or Singapore, all of these places. And the only way it could control the seas by its navy and its merchant navy. Britannia, as they say, ruled the waves. And also at the start of the 20th century was a mass movement of migration of people from the old world, Europe, Great Britain, Ireland, etc., to the new world, America, South America, and to a lesser extent, Australia. And of course, the only way you could get from the old to the new was, of course, by ship. And Britain had a stranglehold with the Cunard Line, the White Star Line, of these uh, shipping companies to provide um, the passage to America. Now, at the start of the 20th century, of course, she started to get com um, competition from the German liners. They produced the um, four German flyers. They were the biggest at the time. And also, the, um, they got um, competition from the Americans who were buying up the shipping, uh, shipping companies. Now, to head off this, what Britain decided to do was offer massive subsidies and um, it, shipbuilding tech technologies to its um, the shipping company, the Cunard Line. And as a result of that, in 1907, the Cunard Line had ordered two ships which were produced and they were 50%, sorry, 100% bigger than anything that had gone before. The ships of the German flyers, the big competition were about 18, 19,000 tonnes. The ones that the Cunard has built were 34,000 tonnes, double in size. They were the Lusitania and the Mauritania. And what the British government did when they offered these um, subsidies to build these magnificent ships, two things they required. One is they could be requisitioned at the time of war and were, or Mauritania was, and they had to be fast. And the reason they had to be fast is during war to use them as troop ships, etc. They had to outrun destroyers and battleships and the Mauritania did. So weighing in the 34,000 tonne, speed them up to 26 knots, they were the greyhound of the seas and they set the new standard and British pride was restored. The White Star Line of course was a um, competitor and it 
prior to the building of these new superliners was the had the biggest amount of ships in the world and but they were of course with the uh, Lusitania and the Mauritania and the German new luxury ships had to do something to try and claw back the competition and the business they were losing. So what they decided to do was with their preferred shipbuilder which was Harlan Wolf of Belfast they ordered three liners to be constructed which were to become the Olympic class ships Olympic, Titanic and Britannic and there was three in the series so when built every, and completed every Wednesday at noon one of the ships would head off to New York the next Wednesday the next one etc etc so there was a loop now, Harland and Wolf, of course, was a um, the shipbuilder, and at the time was the best shipbuilder in Britain. And Britain at that time were the best shipbuilders in in the world. Harland and Wolf is situated in Belfast. It's now in liquidation. It's no longer, and it literally constructed most of the White Star um, ships. At the time of uh, Titanic's uh, construction, Belfast had a population of approximately a quarter of 250 odd thousand people. The same population as Geelong. Now, I don't know if you know where Geelong is, but it's 78 miles down the highway. And if you go down there, you'll see the 200, 2022 Premiership Cup. <laughs> But I'd wait for another wait for another eight months, and there'll be the 2023 <laughs> Premiership. But look, I digress. And at the time of Titanic's construction, Belfast was the jewel in Queen Victoria's crown. It had one of the biggest rope works in the world. It produced um, cigarettes, the uh, Benson and Hedges. It had distilleries, and it was the linen capital in the world, and it was the greatest shipbuilder in the world. At its peak, Harland and Wolf employed 35,000 people. And at the time Titanic was being constructed, it employed approximately 15,000. 4,000 of which worked directly on the ship itself. Now, Titanic's keel was laid on the 31st of March, 1909. She took three years to build. And when she was being built, she was built alongside her sister ship and Harlan and Wolf to accommodate these big leviathans had to uh, build new slipways and gantries in order to accommodate these massive liners. Now the keel is built first which is the bottom of the ship and then arising the steel uh, ribs which is almost like the frame of the house and on the frames of the ship on the slipways, which is literally um, up against the River Lagan, is put on the big steel sheets. They're 30 feet by 6 feet by 1 inch thick, and of course, in those days, they were riveted on. Titanic had about over 3 million rivets, and they were riveted by the rivet gangs, who were the, um, um, the, the master tradesmen of the yards and the most highly paid. Now, she was uh, ready to be launched. Now, when we're talking about launch, it's not launch ready for sailing. It's just she's pushed into the uh, river from the slips and it's just a steel hull with a superstructure and it's pushed in, launched, taken to the um, fitting out docks and ultimately the dry dock and where it's finished. At the time, she was actually pushed into the river and launched 100,000 people, which is a grand final crowd. Now, you're probably not used to grand finals, but we in Geelong are. But um, 100,000 people attended the launch of, um, of the Titanic. Now, Titanic was a steam-driven ship. RMS stands for Royal... Um, mail steamship and as a result she had 29 boilers which is a lot and they were gigantic they were fired and heated with 159 furnaces who and they of course were coal burning now these boilers of course uh, produced the steam to drive its three gigantic engines and they were gigantic 
and the three engines of course um, turn the propeller shafts and the propeller shafts turn the propellers and she was known as a triple screw ship now she had four funnels only needed three funnels to remove the smoke from its three engine but the reason why it had four funnels because the the German flies and the Mauritania and the Lusitania which had four engines and four uh, propellers it wanted to look as impressive as these um, Cunard liners. So if you ever see photos, and there's hardly any photos of Titanic, but art, artists' drawings of Titanic, a lot of them you see the four funnels are smoking away merrily. And you can tell your friends that the last one is only a dummy and it didn't smoke at all. Anyway, it was approximately 10 storeys high and she had 10 decks and she was completed around the uh, 2nd of April um, 1912 and she did a sea trials on the Belfast Lock and she was handed over to the White Star Line at 8pm and she became a White Star ship. Now, she immediately leaves um, Belfast for the last time, moves down the Irish Sea and arrives at Southampton on the south coast of England on the 4th of April, ready for her maiden voyage, commencing at noon on the 10th of April. Now, when she arrives at um, Southampton, she is known as one of the safest ships that the uh, the world had seen because she when she was constructed she was constructed with 16 watertight compartments now just think of a, an ice cube container if you pour water into one of the compartments it just sits there it doesn't go anywhere and you could load up three or four of the compartments and it doesn't go anywhere and that's why it made her practically unsinkable and in the shipbuilder magazine she was referred to as practically unsinkable. The word practically soon got dropped off and of course she was always known as the unsinkable Titanic. She also had lifeboats, 20 of them, and they were built by Harlan and Wolfe. They were reinforced, they were the latest and best um, of uh, the the boats that the light boats they could have they had a new davit system the davits are the little cranes you could stack light boats four so one two three four and then you could load four it had 16 davits and four times 16 i think it's 64 so she could have carried 64 light boats she was designed by Carlisle, the uh, designer, to carry 40. And prior to completion, that was reduced to 20. So when she gets to Southampton, she has um, 20 lifeboats capable of carrying 1,178 passengers, and she had in excess of 2,200 passengers. If you do the arithmetic, there's uh, enough room in the boats if fully loaded for only half. In fact, if she was fully loaded, she would have had three and a half thousand people on board and there would have been an even more appalling loss of life. Also, she had the latest in wireless technology. That's, you know, the dot, 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 dash, 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 the Marconi. Um, it, it was bigger and uh, wider than, and more modern than any ship. So, she arrives on the, um, the south coast of um, um, ready to sail. Just bear with me. At, on the 4th. Now, what happens between the 4th and the 10th? She starts to get coal. She carried 7,000 tonnes of coal. It starts to be crude. She had um, eight officers, Captain Smith, 
Chief Officer Wild, First Officer Murdoch, Lightholder, Pittman, Lowe, um, and all that. So it had the crew, and then all the other crew, such as stewards, stewardesses, cooks, um, just normal um, engineers, and then of course the black gang who worked at the bowels of the ship, stoking the fires, they were called stokers, they had trimmers to keep the, the coals, and all of that. Most of the people, as I said, 80% came from Southampton, and then of course the, um, they had then the passengers, of course. They had some um, notable passengers, some of the notable passengers were Jacob Astor. He was reputed, American, reputed to be the wealthiest uh, person in the world. He was about 54 when he sailed on Titanic with his 18-year-old bride who was pregnant at the time. I suppose if you're the wealthiest bloke in the world and you're 54, you can afford an 18-year-old bride, but we won't go into that. Also was Ida and Isadora Strauss. They were part owners of Macy's. I don't know if you ever saw Cameron's um, Titanic, the film. When they're loading the boat, Mrs. Strauss's maid gets into the boat. She then follows. Her husband is there. They won't let him in. She then says, I've been with my husband for most of my life. If he can't come, I am not coming. She hops out of the boat and goes back to the cabin, this is in the film, and they both perish. My wife of uh, 50 years of marriage dearly loves me, but she wouldn't give up a seat for me. <laughs> there was Benjamin Guggenheim of Guggenheim Museum fame opposite uh, Central Park in New York. If you've been to New York, you've been to Guggenheim. He was traveling. He lost his life as Astor lost his life, as the Strausses lost their life. Also, too, if you ever cross the, um, the Brooklyn Bridge, Washington Roebling, the son of the bloke who started construction and he completed it, he was on board and he lost his life. But it was a ship for millionaires and first class travel certainly made money for the shipping companies. And that's one of the reasons why, oddly enough, they only had a limited amount of um, boats. It had the davits four, on eight on the port side, but midships there was a gap, so the first class passengers could take the view of the Atlantic. And on the starboard they had four up near the bow and four near the stern, and midships was left blank. So she only had 16, and notwithstanding, she could have stacked them, but they didn't want to stack them because that would clutter the boat deck. All the boats were on the boat deck, and that was the domain of the first class. Okay, now, not only was Titanic the biggest single moving object the world had ever seen, and it had the latest safety um, um, with the compartments and the, uh, their boats, and the Marconi and all of that that was built in. It was the fitting out of Titanic which sets it apart from her sister who sailed a year before and almost identical um, um, dimensions and whatever, but Titanic was slightly heavier. But the unparalleled luxury of first class was um, something to behold. They say the eating uh, facilities and the food was better than any first um, class hotel on land. The, it had um, uh, things like a gymnasium, swash court, it had Turkish bath, whatever a Turkish bath is, swimming pool, and it had three electric lifts, all for first class comfort. And some of the rooms in first class were huge and had their own promenade, nearly 50 feet long, 50 feet long promenade. And the, um, the suites, the expensive suites, um, they were something like um, two bedrooms, a sitting room, and this uh, promenade deck. 
and really was built um, for luxury. Second class, of course, Titanic had three classes. Second class, they say, was better than any first class ship in um, going around, and although it was a lot less um, luxurious than first class, but it was still of a very high standard. And third class, and a lot of people refer to as steerage, the third class was comfortable, clean, new. Titanic didn't have any steerage class. Steerage class is when you have a huge, like an auditorium, and everybody sleeps in the one room, in the whole lot. And some ships did that, but Titanic, every passenger in third class had a cabin. Some of them had to share up to six, maybe eight in a cabin, but they had their own cabins. And more importantly, when you see the menu, they were fed three times a day, and the food was um, what you'd get in a buffet hotel of, um, in the city of Melbourne at the moment. And third class, in fact, the poor Irish migrants were heading off to America, were getting better food on board than they would at their home. And in some liners, or older liners, third class had to bring their own food. Now, considering it's a seven day journey to cross the Atlantic, I don't know how that's possible, but um, it just shows you the state of luxury in all classes that Titanic um, offered. Now, the first class, they had the, they were all, all in much the, uh, the classy rooms of midships, and they, as the boat deck and the decks, decks below, the second class below them, and the lower you go down is third class down near the bottom with the engines and all of that. So when she was ready to sail, everything was okay, and on Wednesday the 10th of um, April, she slips out of a mooring at Southampton, into the River Test, then out to the English Channel bound for northwest France, the port of Cherbourg. Although there was an incident at the, um, when she left her moorings, the, um, the sailing ship or the cruise line uh, New York, because of the, um, the water and the vortex that was formed when Titanic was leaving, she broke her mooring and the Titanic and New York nearly collided. It held her up for an hour and um, um, a collision was narrowly avoided by uh, the skill of the tugman pulling the two um, ships away from each other. She arrives in Cherbourg, as I said, on the northwest coast of France. Tenders she doesn't go into harbour because she's too big. Tenders go out there to bring on first class and second class passengers and then they take off first and second class passengers. The second tender takes off the third class passengers and the mail. And then when that's done, she then heads off west or northwest to uh, Queenstown on the south coast of Ireland. Now, Queenstown is no longer called Queenstown. It's the uh, port, um, it's now Cove, or spelt C-O-B-H. It's the port a town of um, the city of Cork. So if you go to Cork, that in fact Cove is just a, a five minute drive. Um, now, Titanic arrives in Queenstown at 11 o'clock on the 11th. She stays there for an hour and a half and once again, passengers are taken off, more passengers are taken on. Now, curiously enough, and by the way, I'll, I'll make a claim here. I am Protestant Irish, but coming off the boat was a Jesuit priest, name of Father Brown. Now, the reason why we're talking about Father Brown, he was an amateur photographer, and when he died, he left 45,000 photo plates, he was a shutterbug. But 30 of those plates were photos of Titanic and they're the only existing photos of life on board Titanic. And they were taken by the good father, the, uh, Francis Brown. Now I thought 
these good Jesuit priests, they give themselves to God and they sacrifice and, you know, they'd be down with third class, wouldn't they? No, no, he travelled first class. But, as I said, I'm Protestant and I make no further comment on that. <laughs> now, at 1.30, they arrive at 11 and 1.30 they then head off. No sightseeing in Ireland. If you're a cruise ship and you arrived in Ireland... You would get off and see the sights, but no, no, it was just purely perfunctory, off it goes. So at 1.30 on the 11th of um, April, she steams past the um, Emerald Hills of Ireland and heads due west to New York, her final destination in approximately six days' time. Now, the... Um, the Next day, which is Friday and Saturday, the 12th and 13th, uneventful <laughs> days, they, um, the passengers sat down to enjoy the magnificent ship they were on heading towards New York. The seas were calm, the weather was exceptionally cold, but they headed off towards New York. Now, the... Um, I'm having a, a bit of trouble with... I've mixed my notes up here. But anyway, we'll see how we go. Um, the, the next day, which is Sunday, the 14th, it's exceptionally cold and, in fact, almost freezing. The captain who takes the church service in the open cancels it, has it indoors, first class. The lifeboat drills are also cancelled as a result of the cold. And then the wireless operators start receiving at 9am the first of what is called several ice warnings. Titanic receives approximately lots of ice warnings, but six of them were major ice warnings in relation to where she was travelling. Now, as I said, she was fitted with Marconi um, equipment. Uh, Phillips and Bride are the Marconi operators. They belong, are employed by Marconi, but under the captain's um, um, control. Their job is to, when they receive messages for the ship or the captain, is to post them to the bridge. Their radio room is just behind the bridge, so it's just a matter of going into the next room. And also, the secondary part is that you could, and Marconi made money of it, was personal uh, telegrams for the passengers. So in other words, if you were on board Titanic and you wanted to send a message to your mum or dad or husband or wife, you would send them a conigram. And they would, because they were extremely expensive, they were relatively brief, and it went something like, having a wonderful on, a time on Titanic, wish you were here. Mm. But that was the, the role of the Marconi operator. So what becomes in at nine o'clock, the first one, warning Titanic that there is uh, ice, um, um, an ice field ahead, there was growlers and bergs ahead, and they give the position of when, see a ship coming from, the Masaba is coming from New York to Liverpool, and it's passing this ice field and seeing bergs and all that. They just warn ships that there's icebergs, field ice, and they give the location. And then it gets more and more of these ice warnings, warning Titanic that there is ice field ahead and there's growlers and bergs of massive size ahead and they're telling Titanic the actual position in which these were spotted. Now, we're not sure what happens, but we do know it properly charted 
In other words, in the chart room, they put all these warnings. The officers who were on the bridge, and there was always two officers at any given time, any of them would know during the day that Titanic was heading for a massive ice field 68 miles wide. And iceberg all over the place. Now, when I got interested in Titanic, I thought, how stiff can you be? You're in the middle of the Atlantic and you hit an iceberg. And if you've been in the Atlantic, it's vast. And it's during the, you can just see forever. And if there was an iceberg on the horizon, you could see it and you would do it. But nothing was done in relation to these warnings. What could have been done in relation to the warnings? It could have stopped. And we know that in that area where, in fact, the collision occurred, there was numerous ships all around. Titanic wasn't alone in the Atlantic. It was too far from ships to come to her rescue, but there were ships all around it. The Californian was holed up for the night, a short distance away. The Carpathia was holed up for the night. Mount Temple was held up for the night. They were all decided we would wait until dawn and dawn came in about 4.30 and then you can see and off you go. But if it didn't want to stop, it could have slowed down because we now know from the evidence given at the time of the collision, Titanic was going as fast as it could go, approximately 22 and a half knots, its full clip. So it didn't slow down. It could have put more lookouts on. They had two up in the crow's nest, and we'll get to them in a minute. It could have put one right at the bow where there was a telephone at, 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 at deck level. Could have done anything. Nothing was done. Here you got warning. Now, if you're driving to Geelong, we won't go into, we won the premiership, but if you're going to Geelong... And there was warnings on your CB radio that there's a flak on the road and there's danger and it's slippery and there's oil slicks and all that. What would you do? You would think you would slow down or stop and wait until it's finished. But no, not Titanic. So there was a suggestion that Titanic was trying to beat the speed limit. Now that's nowhere near, it's a myth. The reason being is because when she starts off, not all her boilers were working and she wasn't going full tilt. It's only when she leaves, um, and also too, she was an hour held up at um, Sherberg before getting to Sherberg. But it was only when she starts getting out into the middle of the Atlantic she starts to press on and starts to gain revolutions to a maximum speed. So the myth that she was trying to beat the fastest crossing in the Atlantic and get the Blue Ribbon couldn't possibly do it. By the way, the Blue Ribbon was held by the Mauritania who could do about 26 and a half knots for 20 eight years. It was astonishing that the Cunardas were so fast. But the White Star Line, Olympic class, were built for comfort and luxury, not for speed. There's some suggestion, though, that she was pushing on to try and beat Olympics for a record and, more importantly, get Titanic to New York on time or in front of time or on schedule because that's good for revenue and it's good for publicity. But whatever the um, conjecture about speed records or whatever, she was travelling too fast in the circumstances. Now, at about 10 o'clock, Reginald Lee and Frederick Fleet take over from Jewel and Simons in the crow's nest. The crow's nest is in front of the bridge and it's up high. It has a bell, a telephone, and the lookouts just sit there and peer out into the darkness. When Fleet and Lee take over, they were warned by Jewel and Simons to keep an eye out for ice because they'd been given the warning when they went up to the lookout. The lookouts um, 
did uh, two hour shifts. There were six lookouts, all doing two hour shifts. Interesting enough, all the lookouts, believe it or not, survived. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. At 11.40, peering into the darkness, Frederick Fleet sees the iceberg. He immediately rings the bell three times, which is behind him. That's indicative that three bells on board ship means danger right ahead. He rings the telephone down to the bridge and the bridge is just below him and with the chilling words, iceberg right ahead. Murdoch, the first officer who's on board um, with Moody, the sixth officer Moody, tells Hinchin the, at, the, at the helm, hard the starboard. Hard the starboard, of course, is to pull the wheel to the right, and in those days, it made the ship turn to port or to the left. It's different now, but he gives the order hard to starboard. He orders the engine stop. There's some suggestion he orders them in reverse and more importantly, orders that the, the, the switch on the electric switch to close the watertight doors, which remain open during sailing of the watertight compartments. Everybody holds their breath and waits. For the time the order is given, iceberg ride right ahead until the scraping on her starboard side, 37 seconds elapse. When the collision occurs, most of the passengers who are asleep are unaware what's happened. At the uh, Board of Trade inquiries, they said they felt a uh, a tremor or a shock, but there was no cataclysmic whack, what the hell was that? Well, there's another expression of that, we won't get there. But the captain immediately goes to the bridge, his quarters, by the way, next to the bridge. He immediately on the bridge and asks Murdoch what's going on. He's told, we have hit ice, sir. He then orders the carpenter to sound the ship to check what was going on. And the collision, of course, it's 11.40. Andrews, Thomas Andrews, who's the designer, is part of the guarantee group from White Star Line. He's travelling to make sure everything on the maiden voyage is OK. He arrives on the bridge and he and the captain go down to where the damage is, which is on the starboard side board of boiler room number six. And in a remarkable Accurate assessment, Thomas Andrews tells the captain that the ship is doomed and has got no more than two hours to survive. Now, one of the problems is, is why the lookouts couldn't spot the iceberg as they gave because the night was exceptionally clear but it had unusual atmospheric or haziness and the sea was described as like polished glass a, or a mill pond. It was dead flat. Now, that had it been, I don't know if you've ever been to in the middle of the Atlantic and seen the war films about warships, the seas. I've been on a cruise ship where, in fact, that the, the ship almost is airborne, that the seas are so rough. It's one of the roughest seas in the world. It's not quite, it's a bit away from the Bay of Biscay, which is the roughest seas in the world, but it's normally rough. This was completely flat. And the experts say if it had been lots of waves crashing, the icebergs would have been spotted because you could see the foam all around the icebergs. But because of there was none of that, none lapping, it was very difficult for them to see. And also to the lookout, which normally has binoculars, they were locked in a case. The second officer was bumped off and he took the key with him. They couldn't find the binoculars. But Shackleton, Ernest Shackleton, that great explorer, said it wouldn't have made a difference had they had binoculars or not. But binoculars or no, they, um, it, uh, um, they doubt if they would have actually seen the, um, the iceberg in time. Now, the 
25 minutes after the collision, the captain orders that the lifeboats be uh, stripped down and get ready for uh, landing, uh, lowering. And in 45 minutes, he then, or before he, he orders that um, the people get into the lifeboats, he gets Boxall, the fourth officer, to work out a fix where Titanic is. And also, once he's found, he gets Bride and Phillips, the Marconi operator, to start sending out distress signals. Now, CDQ, or C, sorry, CQD, was the distress signal. Some people say that's come quick distress, but um, we don't know. And also, it, uh, Titanic starts to send out the new Fandangle distress signal, which was SOS. Titanic wasn't the first, but it's one of the first ships to use the new SOS. And the radio operators kept sending signals that we we're in distress to any ships um, and lots of ships, including the, her sister ship Olympic, who was 600 miles away, were picking up the distress signals. The radio operators, they kept sending the signals up until about five minutes before she actually sank. Phillips dies and Bride um, um, remains alive. Now, 45 minutes after the, uh, the sinking, the captain has, gives the orders, which are now famous now, women and children first. On the port side, Lightholler, the second officer, interprets that as women and children only. On the starboard side, Murdoch, the first officer, interprets it as women and children first. So if you're on the port side and you're a male, you had to please yourself. And in fact, when you see the figures, that Lightholder gets 301 people away and Murdoch gets 404 people away. So it was important to be on the, if you're a male, to be on the um, starboard side. Now, it's the handling of the boats that becomes the disaster and the, the real um, the problem with the story. The first boat that gets launched, and there's 20 of them, it gets away with a, um, only 28 passengers on board, or um, people on, uh, on the, the, the boat, and it could hold 65. The fifth boat to leave gets away with 12 people on board, seven of which are crew and five, no, that's the, whatever the arithmetic, the rest are millionaires. It wasn't until the 13th boat to be launched from Titanic did it contain third class passengers. And the whole thing was just schmozzle and right near the end in fact, the boats were fully loaded and they were all launched. And in fact, the last boat to be launched literally floated off the Titanic. Now, the, I can go through all the, uh, all the boats and all the names and the passions, but I won't do so. But as a result, the boats get away and shortly thereafter at the next day, the 15th of April at 2.20, Titanic sinks to the bottom of the Atlantic. And the people who didn't get on the boats got life preservers and jumped into the sea. Now, one thing that haunted the 705 survivors of the, the lifeboats, it haunted them for the rest of their days was the moaning and groaning of people in the water thrashing away with their life. And most of them died, if not all of them died, with the sheer cold, and they only lasted about 10 or 15 minutes before hypothermia set in. Now the question is asked, when the boats were lowered, they were asked to go about three or 400 metres away, which they did, and when it sinks, why didn't the boats go back? And it's the question that 
was partly answered in the Board of Trade and one of the reasons given that they, if they had have gone back and the massive, and there would have been hundreds and hundreds of people thrashing in the water, if your little rowboat goes back and there's only 20 or 30 people in it, you'll be swamped. And they also, the reason why they were three or four hundred metres away is when Titanic end up sinking, there was a fear with the vortex that everything would go with it. Tested proved that that wouldn't have been the case. But it certainly haunted. No one went back except for Fifth Officer Lowe. He has four boats. He gets the women and children and all the passengers into two of the boats and he and fellow crew make their way back. And I don't know if you ever see the film Titanic of Cameron is Rose after she lets um, Jack Dawson go and he dies. And Cameron, who made the film, says if he had to make the film again, he would make the raft that she was on a bit smaller because people say that Jack should have been there. But anyway, in the film, of course, he comes back <coughs> and yells out, can anybody hear me? And Rose, of course, blows the whistle and she saved and all of that. But for all his heroics of going back to try and pick up passengers out of the ocean, he picks up four who have been in the water a long time, two of which, of course, uh, perished. So these boats are floating in the Atlantic at 2.20 when the uh, Titanic sinks. But at 12.25, Carpathia, who's holed up for the night, a Cunard uh, line. By the way, the Cunard line, the ships, Carpathia, Lusitania, Mauritania, all end in IA, whereas the White Star liners, Baltic, Oceanic, Titanic, Cedric, etc., all end in IC. It's a quirky way they named their ships. But pa 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 Carpathia picks up the signal and immediately Captain um, Rostrum springs into action, gets everything going, his engines all ramped up and heads off to the position where Boxhall is given. It's a famous position and heads straight for that area. Now, he is travelling through an ice field and burgers what Titanic was faced with. But he, what he does, he puts as many lookouts as possible on the ship and in fact just ducks and weaves icebergs on his way. And at four o'clock, which was, um, it sank at 2.20, at four o'clock Carpathia picks up the first of Titanic's boat and by eight o'clock, approximately four hours later, all 20 of Titanic's boats are picked up by Carpathia. 705 survivors out of over 2,252 people on board um, survived. Carpathia immediately goes back to um, New York and the passengers are, um, are let off. And then immediately the Senate committee, uh, headed by uh, Smith, no relation to Captain Smith, starts an inquiry into the loss of Titanic. And shortly after that, the Board of Inquiry in England set up Lord Mersey's uh, inquiry into the sinking of Titanic. Both of them were whitewashers. And more importantly, the Board of Trade was a complete whitewash. The Board of Trade was up to his neck because it set the standards, it set the, the minimum boats. The minimum boats, Titanic had 20, the minimum it could have sailed with was 16. The Board of Trade regulations were badly outdated. But notwithstanding that, the Board of Trade looks into um, the cause of the sinking of Titanic. It's about, it's a bit like Dracula looking after the blood bank or doing, correcting your own homework. Both uh, commissions or and looking into inquiries, looking in it, came to the, um, the simple in conclusion. One, the cause of the sinking was the collision with the iceberg and B, Titanic was travelling at a speed excessive in the circumstances. And as a result of the American um, 
um, inquiry. From then on, all barge had to carry light barge for every soul on board. And there's a few other things they tightened up. But Lord Mersey, and I won't go into it because that's um, um, a story in its own. Of course, he blames um, Captain Lord of the California, but that's another story. What he says, he puts no blame on Captain Smith, notwithstanding the ship was travelling excessive speed in the circumstances. No blame on him. All he was doing was a normal sea captain would do. White Star Line, shipping company, and he, of course, um, made sure that Britain uh, shipping companies are not going to be penalised. No fault or no negligence. And Harland and Wolf, the constructing of the ship, no negligence at all. Complete whitewash. Titanic lies on the bottom of the Atlantic until the 1st of September 1985 when she's discovered by Robert Ballard, the American oceanographer. You've probably seen the magnificent um, um, shots of its bow and whatever. It is now declared a historic site and at the moment the subsequent dives to Titanic and the latest one is showing that probably in 10 or 20 years, although that's heavily disputed, she may never be, she'll be just eaten away. Okay. Now, the real hero of the story was Captain Rostrum. He um, heading off to, um, um, to save Titanic. But um, unfortunately, that there was a lot of lives um, lost. Now, when Titanic was built, she was the pride of Belfast. And there were stories, and my great-grandfathers, two of them, worked on the ship, and there's stories that grown men in Belfast would um, be crying because the loss of um, her, the big ship that they produced was a bit of a shock to the system. And it took a fair bit of toll on their morale. But now that the morale is back, and in Belfast you can get T-shirts say, Titanic, she was all right when she left here. <laughs> and there's another one, by the way, that has built by Irishmen and on the back sunk by an Englishman. But anyway, that's... Uh, so I'll leave that with you, um, as we I think we're running a bit short of time. Eric, that's great. We've got a couple of minutes for the... the for questions of the board. Fantastic knowledge, mate. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. I, I, I don't unbelievable. know where my notes were, but anyway. No, unbelievable. Any questions? Yeah. Just thank you. That was fantastic. It's the best turf I've heard for a long time. Oh, hang on. I didn't hear you. Could you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said that was the best turf I've heard in a long time. And what made it so really good, you used words. Yeah. 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 You didn't need a single slide, but your sequence of the presentation brought it all alive as though there were a thousand pictures. I let, I, I, by the way, I left my notes behind and that's why I was struggling, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the judge there next to you is used to all this stuff because in they don't have PowerPoint presentation and this was just fantastic. So thanks for that. I just was curious, you told us about how ships got bigger up to the Titanic. Yes. 80,000 tonnes, yep. Lusitania and Mauritania 34,000 tonnes. Yep. What was the weight of the Titanic? Oh, sorry, I forgot to say it was uh, 46,500 tonnes. That's a big gradation, isn't it? It was 50, um, how it went, these German flyers, and they were this bigger, and then when they at about 18 or whatever, a thousand tons, and that was big in those days, and in a very a couple of years' time, the Lusitania and Mauritania would double the size virtually. <coughs> had gone from one size to double, and then Titanic was 50% bigger than the Mauritania. And because it was so big that the dining rooms and the um, eating rooms and the saloons and all that, and even the cabins were bigger. Everything was bigger. But interesting, when Titanic was um, finished and ready for sailing, the Germans were almost com uh, completing the Imperator, which was going to be 50,000 tonnes. So 
Titanic wouldn't have been the biggest for very long because they were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's why we say about the Board of Trade regulations, they fell behind. They should have, when the ships got bigger, the amount of lifeboats on the ships should have also increased, but they hadn't. How long was the Titanic? Uh, it's, yeah, that's good. 880 feet long by about 97 foot wide. Every school child in Belfast in 1912 could recite Titanic's um, dimensions. It was the same length, width of Olympic. They were built to identical um, plans, but Titanic was, they put in um, other things to make it. She was a thousand tons heavier than her sister ship Olympic. Olympic, by the way, is hardly heard about and she sailed for <coughs> over 28 years until she was retired and um, was a, a, a passenger ship in the, um, troop ship in the First World War. She had a magnificent service and she was luxurious, but people hardly hear about um, Olympic. And if you do, she's Titanic's sister ship. Now, can I, you go on, sorry? Sorry, I was going to ask you, many of these pleasure ships modified for the Second World War as troop ships? Yes. The Britannic was um, turned into a troop ship. She was being built, and then as a result of the collision, her bulkheads um, went up higher to make them more safe, and she was literally all the furniture and all the rooms that just ripped out of these ships and as an Olympic, all it was and just made into just troop carriers and after the war, they were all put back. Well, what about armaments? Yes, I don't think there was any armaments, any extra. There may have been, but I don't think, I think there was. Armed, were they? Hmm? I don't think oh, no, there was no cannons or yeah. guns. No. no, I didn't know if they were reinforced or not with... Um, yeah. Yeah, I think they were built for speed, especially um, the Mauritania. It could outrun anything. Now, can I ask the question, maybe the ladies down the back can answer this, why are ships referred to as a she? Because, because they're elegant. Because they're elegant. <laughs> well, the answer when I'm asked that is in relation to the Tannic, it was beautiful and gracious and all of that, and it could have to be a woman. Now, one thing I'll just quickly say, the Titanic was owned by the International Mercantile Marine Company, which was owned by J.P. Morgan. She was an American ship, yet she sailed under the British ensign. She was crewed by um, all British crew. And that's what people wanted because the British were the best sailors and best shipbuilders. So she f flew the uh, British ensign as if she was a British ship. And in fact, she was an American ship or owned by Americans. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for that. That's for you. That's, uh, yeah, uh, there's a there's a terrific monument at uh, at the port of Cove for the Titanic. Yes. Yeah, which is uh, because you know that was the last the last place it called. So they they built a, 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 a quite a quite a magnificent monument there for the Titanic. So uh, the Irish connection continues. Uh, but Eric, again, thanks very much for your time and your presentation. <laughs> Noel, we're going to do a sing-along to finish up. That's yours. Thank you. Can we hand the, the books around? I'll do it, Joe. I'll
only compartment it was only three or four if they were three she would roll and she was sliced she was not and that's why I went about eight or nine or ten compartments very quickly and they didn't go off the line so they then had no she was faxing around herself but said she wouldn't have been the whole idea of a compartment if she was shipped which happens to be rather difficult. She was rather by the wall. Two yeah. or three yeah. 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 I was yeah. just going to check uh, if some cyclist that was known to the river of the bulkhead is well flowed and the pumps just pumped and it out and she's gone. Right, well, yeah, and see what we can do. I don't mind that. I doubt with her. And it was 300 or 900 feet. It was just big. So if anybody goes to it. Okay, so uh, that's our word. Uncle Noel, Uncle Noel, were you starting with Clementine? Two verses. Two verses. Two verses. Away you go, lad. <laughs> That's it? You want Here's a help from Terry's Majesty. All right. Here's a health on to Her Majesty. The next one there. That's the next one. Top of page two. Top of page two. <laughs> <laughs> right, right on now. So when Irish eyes. Irish eyes are smiling. Sure it's like a morning spring. In the lilt of Irish laughter, you can hear the angels sing. When Irish hearts are happy, all the world seems bright and gay. And when Irish eyes are smiling, sure they'll steal your heart away. Hold on, Bob. All right, guys. Uh, 
great meeting and uh, great to see so many here and see some, some newcomers who hopefully won't be turned off by what they've seen today. <laughs> and they're happy to come back again and go through all this uh, frivolity and nonsense and fun and fellowship. But next month, 14th of March, a big meeting, AGM and our normal meeting. And uh, Women. ladies, of course, are very welcome. And uh, we look so forward to seeing them and as many of us as we can. In the meantime, stay well, stay safe, and uh, see you on the 14th of March. I always go back to it. I don't even know